All right, kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Uh, you're going to like me for a couple of reasons. Number one, there's no text book to read. Number two, there's no paper to write. Okay? So, I mean, this is a piece of cake. Not really. There's a few other assignments that are there as well. Um, the description of the class, it's a careful study of God's chosen people through the un unified, the united kingdom, and then the divided kingdoms, including the background, purpose, plan, and message of each book. Uh, this is a very much a historical section of uh, Scripture, obviously. Um, it goes through uh, 1 Samuel, about halfway through 1 Samuel, uh, as you make the transition from the time of the judges into the time of the kings. Um, so it goes from 1 Samuel all the way through to, uh, well, with including the prophets. We're not going to, we're going to talk about a lot of the prophets, but we're not going to at this point study the, the prophetic books. But this will take you through 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, both of them take you right down to the end of uh, the kingdom of Judah, which was the last of the kingdoms to be destroyed or to be wiped out and uh, taken into captivity. Okay, so the United Kingdom, let's just summarize what we mean by that real quickly. The United Kingdom, of course, is, uh, co is constituted of three kings, Saul, David, and Solomon. So Saul is uh, very much the outsider. Uh, he had one, he had one uh, king in his dynasty, which was himself. And that was it. You know, there's not a dynasty there, obviously. Uh, and then you have David coming on the scene, the man after God's own heart. And uh, we'll see David then from then until the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, someone in the family of David almost always was king, almost. And then Jesus Christ uh, was promised, of course, as the seed of the woman, the seed of da Abraham, the seed of David. Uh, Jesus Christ will one day be the king. Um, the Bible calls him the king of kings in Revelations, where Jesus is literally going to be the ruler of the world. And the Bible is very clear where he's going to rule from, despite what some uh, uh, people try to claim that Jesus will not be king of Jerusalem or Israel. Israel is the modern day Babylon, all this kind of stuff. Uh, the Bible says in Zechariah chapter 14 that Jesus is going to come back to the Mount of Olives and he's going to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem. And it says that in a number of other prophetic books. That's just one of them. Anyway, so... We see the United Kingdom coming from Saul and then the family of David. Well, after Solomon, of course, because of his sin, and we'll look at that later, and because of his uh, rebellion, really, against uh, God's order of having uh, more than one wife. Uh, he had a few more than one wife. Uh, he eventually, of course, brings God's judgment upon Israel. Um, We'll look at this, and this is a very interesting thought to me, and a very interesting topic. You might want to do a study on this sometime. But uh, the dividing of the kingdom really had roots of the divide of the division long, long, long before Solomon. Okay, the northern kingdom always felt a little disenfranchised, if you know what I mean by that. They always felt like they were treated different than the, than the southern kingdom. Okay? And you see that already in the judges before there ever was a king. Okay? So we'll look at that later on, but that, to me that's very interesting. It didn't just all of a sudden click, Solomon dies, everybody's ready to leave. Uh, there were roots of that for a long time before that came to fruition. <clears throat> the divided kingdom, of course, then, uh, is made up of many, many, many kings. In the northern kingdom... Uh, of Israel, they had almost all bad kings. There's a couple of kings that were decent, but most of all of them were very bad or at least bad. <laughs> okay, they uh, did evil in the sight of the Lord. They worshiped false gods. They allowed other gods to come into the land. They never wiped out the, the high places and the groves of, uh, and so on. And so this, the northern kingdom was always sinful and 
they, they lasted about uh, 200 years um, from the time of the dividing of the kingdom until Assyria conquered the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom lasted an extra 125 years or so. So, anyway, the, this, oh, and the southern kingdom was uh, comprised of good kings and bad kings. Okay? Um, for the most part, their good kings, well, all the good kings, of course, I think almost all the good kings, not all, almost, all the good kings were of the line of David. And then there was a few who, uh, well, a number who were bad and who were of the line of David also. And then there's a few outsiders, such as, Anybody remember an outsider who became uh, the leader of the country? Anybody remember? How about the daughter of Jezebel? Athaliah. Uh, she was a wicked witch. <laughs> um, like her mother. Uh, she learned very well from her mother. Uh, she killed all of her grandkids. Athaliah did. Uh, that's not normal, you know. I believe me. My mom is a grandmother like 42 times over. And I'm not kidding. And she loves her grandkids. You know, that's normal. And so, uh, anyway, so there's an outsider of the family of Ahab and Jezebel coming into the southern kingdom as the ruler. Uh, what a mess. Okay, so that's the United Kingdom. And the divided kingdom in, uh, in short. <clears throat> There's no text for the class. The outside work. Now, here's where I've added quite a few things to the class. And I, I hope that you'll get uh, a blessing from these. I hope you enjoy the, your studies. Okay? The first uh, two things there are studies. Uh, such as... Uh, uh, what is it going to say? Like a, not a word study, but, but a topical study of something. And in this case, <clears throat> Psalms. The students will do two Bible studies discussing David's experience that led to the writing of a psalm. Okay? Now, in our library, we have, have uh, books, several uh, different authors uh, who write about the psalms of David. And in those books, they lead up to, or they give the background to the writing of the psalm. Um, you know, just like we have, if you've ever looked at these, I have several in my office, uh, hymn stories. So these, these songs that we sing in church, you know, somebody didn't just sit down and say, I'm going to write 50 songs. And so they wrote these songs one after the other about the love of God and the forgiveness of you know, that's not how it happens. It's almost always an experience that they went through and it led them to the writing of a song that, was, that really meant something. <clears throat> have any of you ever written a song? I have not, but I thought it would be interesting to ask. Charity, you're musical, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> so, nobody has, huh? Okay. We don't have any... Uh, Phillips, what's his name? Bliss. We don't have any Philip Blisses in here. <laughs> Philip Chavez. <laughs> no, not quite. So anyway, so you'll do two Bible studies discussing the experience of David that led to the writing of a psalm. Now, there's several that are very easy. Right? Okay. I'm not saying nobody should do those. Psalm 51. Or Psalm 32, those two uh, generally are fit with the story of Bathsheba. And so I'm not saying nobody should do those. Now all of you are saying, ah, oh, it's one of mine, you know, if nobody else. Anyway, but think of some other ones. There's plenty of others that are identifiable. Some of them are even listed right in the scripture, right under the chapter, the, the title chapter. Uh, there's, a, there's a heading there that says what the story was behind this. So there's, when most of the Psalms, many of the Psalms that David wrote were written while he was fleeing from King Saul. And so those are, those are great Psalms for people who are discouraged or distressed. Yes, did you have a question? Um, do they have to be uh, David's Psalms or can they be from various other ones like Moses or someone else? Uh, let's, let's stay with David mm -hmm. because this is kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Sure. So, okay. Um, 
I'm thinking about, and don't, don't just fill them with, with fluff, but I'm thinking about a, a page or a page and a half for each of these. And, and these, um, I, I, I'm, I'm imagining, okay, this is the first time that I've given this assignment. I'm, I'm thinking along the lines of paragraphs, okay? So on these, you'll put your name at the top, <coughs> um, Josh, Swords were, and uh, and and the date, of course. Um, what is today? September the 9th um, of fifteen. And then you'll just you'll put Psalm fifty one. Um, and if you like, um, I, you know, as I'm standing here, I think of several several main points with that uh, with Psalm fifty one. I think about David's sin that led to, that ex to, the, to the writing of the psalm. And then David's repenting. Everybody knows the story of the sin, so don't spend most of your, of your uh, study on that. But then talk about David's repenting and what, what some of the words mean. Okay, these I don't want just a story. I, I want to study. So what does it mean in Psalm 50? If you did Psalm 51, what does it mean that he... Um, Say, create in me a clean heart, or renew the, the joy of thy salvation. Um, remove not thy Holy Spirit from me. Um, another main point might be the effects of sin in David's life. So, anyway, think of, think of the Psalms and the experience of David that led to the writing of the Psalm, and then go through the Psalm briefly and pointing out the what David felt or what he, what he was saying when he wrote that psalm. Okay? I'm, I'm really looking for you not to do... I'm, I'm, I understand my, some, uh, somebody will do Psalm 51, but I'm really looking for you to learn something. You already know Psalm 51. So I'm looking for you to learn something that you didn't know before you started this. <clears throat> okay? Now, if you didn't know that Psalm 51 was about the sin of David and Bathsheba, then write about it. I don't care. Is that fair? So, Robert. <laughs> I never heard that story before. Hmm, that's a new one. All right, a psalm study. I think that'd be an interesting thing. Uh, see David's experiences there leading to the writing. Then secondly, a Proverbs study. Okay, now... Uh, Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived until, <laughs> until he started doing what he said not to do in the book of Proverbs. Okay? Uh, it's so funny, and ironic, you know, Proverbs 7, he warns over and over and over, and actually all through Proverbs, about the strange woman. And then what does he do? He takes in many strange, the word strange literally means foreign women. I mean, that's exactly what he did. He took in all these foreign women that uh, didn't have the same... It's not wrong to marry a foreigner. I'm not saying that. Um, but when they bring their gods with them, you got a problem. So anyway, the students will do a study of an element of the wisdom of Solomon demonstrated in his knowledge about any of the sciences. Now, I'm being very specific with that. Um, I want you to show Solomon's wisdom as it relates to sciences, biology, uh, the animals. I, I forget all the names. Zoology, um, schoology. Yes, that's a great science that we have here at Fairhaven. If you can figure out schoology, you're very wise. <laughs> so. But a proverb study, does that sound, uh, and I'm again thinking about a page, page and a half, a study of something uh, relating to one of the sciences that Solomon was wise about. Which, by the way, uh, I mean, there's so many things. You get later in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 29, 30 and 31, there's a lot of things in there about, about the spider taking hold with her hands, and the conies, and, and on and on. You've got... Uh, Plant life, animal life that he, that he talks a lot about. Um, he understood people. I don't know if that'd be a science, but he talks a lot about observing people. Um, 
Am I think of an sorry? Anthropology. There you go. Yes. I was thinking when he talks about like wine and stuff. What about that? About the wine move it to move it itself. I, I would think that'd be fine. Mm hmm. Okay. So if you think of some uh, some other things along those lines, see me or email me, and uh, and uh, we'll talk about it. Okay, so I thought that would be interesting, uh, the great wisdom of Solomon. Now, here's where we have a few other things now. Seven summaries of kings and three summaries of prophets. Now, let's just talk about these summaries uh, briefly here. All right, students write a one-page summary on different kings of Israel and Judah. If this goes a little bit over a page for some of the more prominent kings, that's fine, but generally about a page. <clears throat> These will contain scripture passages where they are mentioned, the occasion of their crowning. Um, okay, so uh, again, I'm not looking for a big research paper. I'm going to tell you exactly. I'm just thinking one page, your name, the date at the top. Okay, so we'll pick somebody else. We'll get Rick on here. Okay, it's uh, September 9th. And um, let's, uh, Asa. Asa was one of the earlier kings in the divided kingdom in Judah. Um, so let's say that we're doing Asa. Um, I'm really looking for, for you to actually uh, not just use paragraphs, but actually kind of use an outline. So uh, Roman numeral one, let's say, or number one, um, the occasion or uh, scripture passages. There we go. The first thing mentioned. Scripture passages. You list out the scripture passages. Number two, uh, the occasion of their crowning. Now I'm thinking each of these, like a paragraph. Okay? A paragraph. There's some that are very unique. Um, they became the king because they killed the previous king. Uh, they, be they became the king because the previous king died. They became the king because the, the previous king was still the king. There are several of them that were co-regents. They were king with, another, with their father or with another king. And then when the other king finally died, then they took over the entire kingdom. The occasion of their crowning. Commendable and reproachable acts. So the good and the bad. Okay, Asa started out great. Obeyed the Lord. He trusted the Lord. He had a great victory over Ethiopians, I believe it was. It was a huge army of uh, the leader of the Ethiopian army, I believe, was Zerah. Zerah. And uh, he trusted the Lord, and God gave him a great victory. But then he started taking credit for it, and he went out to a different battle, trusting in his own flesh, and he lost, and he got diseased in his feet, and he wouldn't turn back to God. Okay, so commendable and reproachable acts. Historical events. Okay, I, I'm thinking here if, if there's other countries involved or if there was a great earthquake or something, a, a big natural disaster during their reign. <clears throat> and, and like this, again, you just keep going right down the list. Um, alliances. What kind of alliances did they make? Some of the kings didn't make many alliances. Some of the kings made alliances with the wrong people, with the wrong countries, like Syria. Not Ass well, even some with Assyria. Um, oh, who was that? We just heard a message preached on this recently here. Anyway, one guy tried to make an alliance with Assyria to fight against Syria. And the prophet warned him and said, you shouldn't be doing this. Uh, or was it with the Babylonians against the Assyrians? I forget. But anyway, there's, uh, there's those kinds of alliances. Kings in Israel and Judah during their reign. So if you're doing a king of Israel, then who was reigning in Judah during their time? And you could definitely mention what kind of relationship they had, if there was any. And the cause of their end. Okay, um, 
All right, I didn't uh, mention this here, but I want you to understand for sure. Um, I don't want these king summaries done over uh, Saul, David, or Solomon. These are for all the kings after them. I probably should clarify that on my thing here. Discuss the evaluation of God upon their reign. Usually it's pretty simple. He was a good king. <laughs> okay, he was a good king. And why? If the scriptures tell us why he was a good king, and they often do, he, he was good because he wholly followed after the Lord his God, or because he cut down the groves, or usually it was something with destroying the false idols that, uh, made, that God said he's a good king because of it. Any questions on that? Summaries on the kings. Okay. Those will be uh, due at the bottom. You see the assignment schedule. Um, if you can... Um, anyway, so two summaries at a time starting on October the 15th. All right, what is the 29th? Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's October 29th. Okay. <clears throat> All right, summaries of the prophets. The same setup except there's some different things I'm looking for, but a little bit more detail than what I gave you in the king, or, or than what you would have in the king summaries. You write a one-page summary on several prophets of Israel and Judah, covering the interaction between the Old Testament prophet and his king. Include the purpose and significance of the message of the prophets. Okay, so this is a little bit more subjective. I don't have a list out for you, but you'll talk about the interaction Okay? I don't want a big, long story on Elijah. You know, Elijah went to Ahab and did... The, well, we already know that. So keep that part. If you're going to do Elijah, keep that part short. And then... Uh, let me see. Look at it. Uh, and then spend more time on the uh, purpose and significance of the message of the prophets. What is that? Thus saith the Lord. Uh, that's pretty significant. Um, the purpose was that... To me, a large part of the prophet's job was to keep the king in line. Okay? Um, I, I changed this part here. I used to have you write a paper, not you, this class. I used to have this class write a paper on the interaction between a prophet and his king and, and to discuss how th this very unique relationship that God set up, whereas the king is actually the physical, political leader, and he's also the, the religious leader, really, in a lot of ways. But you also have a man of God who's there to keep the king in line. And often, several times, the man of God is not even named. We don't even know who he was. We don't even know what his name was. I'm thinking of Jeroboam and, his, and the prophet that came to him. And Jeroboam put his hand out, remember, and his hand withered up. So, uh, anyway, these prophets had a very unique job, and very often they were hated, and then, of course, uh, punished and abused and so on like that. Jeremiah, um, the people didn't like him, the king didn't like him, scribes and the, the, the authorities didn't like him, put him in prison, put him in the dungeon, and uh, he still kept on telling them what God said. All right, so three prophets. There's a lot of prophets, but I want the prophet to fit into the time period of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Okay, there are some prophets that don't. Uh, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi uh, were prophets who prophesied after the return from exile in Babylon. Um, anyway, yeah. Most of the others, as, as I think about it, most of the others would be fine. Any questions? Of course, you'll probably pick the ones who are not minor prophets. You'll pick the, the or major prophets. You can do the major or the minor prophets. But I'm, I'm thinking even Elijah and Elisha and, and um, who, who is the other prophet who, who fed Obadiah. Uh, the prophet Obadiah who fed a whole bunch of the remnant who God... Who, who stayed true to the Lord during the reign of Ahab. Anyway, so those are some of the prophets that you could do. Yes? Do you want us to stay away from Saul, David, and Solomon for these, these summaries too? 
Oh, I see what you're saying. Like Nathan? Yeah. No, that'd be fine. If you want to do... Uh, that, that's a good question. If you want to do... The, in this case, I would definitely think that it fits more even in the, with the prophets who, who prophesied during the rule of David and Solomon. Samuel? Mm -hmm. Samuel had a unique position. He was a prophet. Mm -hmm. He was a judge. And he was a priest. Okay, so he, he had a lot of responsibilities in different areas. I'd rather you stay away from so, uh, Samuel just because there's so much. Um, you won't be able to do it in one page. But most of the other prophets you should be able to. But no, Nathan, Gad, during the reign of David. Um, who's the prophet during Solomon's reign? Probably Nathan still. So, Yes. All right, and then there'll be reading assignments, some posted to uh, Schoology. And um, when I put a, a reading assignment there, I, I'm gonna, I'll let you know, and I'll put it up there, and I will, I'll have everybody comment on it or even comment on each other's comments. So uh, there'll be some interesting things that I've found that I'll, that I'll put on to Schoology. Okay? All right, the grading, tests, so the studies and the summaries. Assignments are due at the beginning of class time. Any late work receives a zero, so make sure that they are on time and um, turned in. Oh, I didn't do it, did I? I need to give you an access code. I saw all these other teachers on Schoology are t passing out their access codes, and I guess I could have, but <clears throat> here you go. Here's your access code, HG4HH. Um, HG4HH dash, five letters. CZQ, CZQXF. And if you can do that as soon as possible, I know some of you are having a hard time figuring out how to get into Schoology, you know, so <clears throat> you can do that as soon as possible. And, and then most of these we can turn in um, to Schoology, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about that more. <clears throat> all right, we have class tomorrow, as you all probably well know. Um, we have class tomorrow, uh, back in here, and then, of course, next Tuesday, no, I'm sorry, Monday, right? I'm getting my class days mixed up. <clears throat> it used to be Monday and third, or I used to be Tuesday and I can Maybe it was Monday and Thursday, I forget. Anyway, so we'll have class uh, tomorrow, and then class Monday, and then next Thursday, your first psalm study is due. Okay? So a week from tomorrow, the first psalm study is due. Yes? As far as the tests, are they cumulative, or is each test... Um, I normally have cumulative tests, but I normally pass, or no, I normally put the old tests in the library and let you study off of those. So, for, for the past material. Everybody understand what I mean by that? Mm -hmm. So, the first test, the second test that we just did, so it's that the final is the only thing that'd be a cumulative. And then on the final, I have a section of the final that's off of the previous tests, and both of the previous, or three previous tests will be in the library for you to study. Okay, any questions? So, a lot of work, not too much. I mean, there's a lot of small things as you go along. So, <clears throat> some classes naturally uh, lend themselves to uh, a lot of library books and a lot of library study. Um, uh, our library isn't very well stocked. I don't mean in a knock, but it's not like we're going to have books on Rehoboam and books on, you know, Jehoshaphat and, and so on. But um, uh, we, we would have a lot of books on uh, the, the first several kings. David, um, books on Saul. Somebody preached a message recently on, on Saul's failed leadership. 
Um, and I thought that was very, very interesting. And I've studied that out some more. And uh, I've, you know, I've, I've always felt that Saul's time was kind of a wasted time. Well, now I kind of see it as it was, a, it was an example of bad leadership. And the children of Israel suffered for it and paid for it. Once David came on the scene, uh, God set up the kingdom the way that uh, it was supposed to be. But anyway, there's something to be learned in, in each of these men. So, very interesting. All right, I know this uh, map, I don't have it set up here. But if we can uh, think about this a little bit <clears throat> before I get going. I want to put uh, this class into some context, okay? And in order to do that, um, it's good. Those of you who were in the class last semester, I know that's been three months ago, and you probably haven't thought about it since. But um, if you have, that's great. But just to put it into context, we've, we've gone through the time period of the judges. And the transition from the judges to the kings was Samuel, as I mentioned. Um, he's the last of the judges. Uh, he reign, ruled, uh, reigned, not he didn't reign, but he ruled for a long period of time. Um, he also had a lot of authority over, it looks like, over other judges and even then uh, in the extended ministry into the time of the kings, he had a lot of authority over the kings. Okay, um, let's put uh, a little bit of time frame on this. I pulled up my map, but I'm not quite ready for that yet. Let's put some time frame into this. <clears throat> I gave you some dates, uh, not you, but some of you got some dates yesterday in Old Testament survey. But let's, let's look at the time period that we're in and uh, make sure that we're you know, getting the big picture. I always like to look at the big picture first. Um, the time of the kings of Israel and Judah <clears throat> overall goes from 1050 until uh, 586. Okay, so what is that? Uh, almost 500 years total. Uh, going from Saul, beginning of Saul's reign, until the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. Now, that, that, is the, that is what we're going to focus on this semester. Okay? Um, I don't, typically, I don't get through. There's just so many kings, and I normally phase this last part of it into at least the destruction of Jerusalem. I know for sure I will not cover the destruction of Jerusalem in this, in this semester. Uh, it kind of fits with the second temple period, destruction of the first temple, and moving on into that era. But um, anyway, so 1050 to 586. Now, what has just taken place before this? Um, there's been about 350 years of a period of the rule of the judges. So they came into the land in 1406 is when the, the conquest uh, begins to take place. The conquest and judges. You got it. So the conquest and judges period is about 350 years. Now, you don't get 350 years by adding all of the judges together. Okay? If you go through the book of Judges and you see this guy reigned for 20 years and this guy reigned for 40 years, reigned, I, I'm sorry, I used that word. This guy ruled the land for 20 years and 40 years and 10 years and the land had rest for 80 years and then they fell into sin again. If you add all of those dates together, you come up with way more than 350 years. Okay, you're going to come up with around 500 years. Say, well, what's the problem then? Um, you have to take the outside dates. We know, that we know some of these outside dates here and here, and you just figure out from those dates how long the period of the judges was. You can't take the actual date. So what that means is the, the, that each of those dates that are listed for the judges, each of the 20-year periods and the 40-year periods and the 80-year periods, that some of those, many of those, overlapped each other. So in the, in the land of Israel, okay, you'd have several 
You know, you'd have several judges ruling at once. You'd have judges here to the north. Deborah was up here in the north and Barak. Uh, you'd have uh, Gideon up here in the north at a different time. But you'd also have Samson down here. He was one of the later judges. Um, the, the Philistines' rise to power had taken place already by that time. Uh, you've got a, a judge over here, uh, Ehud. You've got Jephthah over here in this area. Some of these judges, all I'm saying is that some of these judges overlapped. <clears throat> you say, well, how do we know then that it was about 350 years? What are some of the outside dates, the parameters that we can set and then work our way back to 350 years? Let's just talk about this. I don't have time to give you all the background on each of these dates. I mentioned this yesterday in my class for some of you, but <clears throat> um, I probably should go over here. 966 BC was the year that the temple was begun to be built. It was started in 966 BC by Solomon. We know that from 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. The Bible is very clear on that. <clears throat> All right, First Kings chapter 6, verse number 1. The Bible says, It came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month Ziph, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. Okay? So... That doesn't say 966 B.C. I understand that. And I, again, I don't have time to give you all of the details of this. I do that in a different class. But scholars worldwide recognize that date. And I'm not saying Bible scholars. I'm saying Bible critics. Everybody is, believes that within about five years of that date, 966 to 970, that that is a hard, fast date. Okay? There's no, there's, there's very little argument on that. Okay? And I don't have time to tell you how we find that date right now, but that is, that is a hard, fast date. And it's based primarily on astronomy and an and eclipse of the sun, and that is a hard, fast date. Okay? That's something we can, we can hang our hats on if you're in the West. Okay? You can hang, if you're Amish, you know, you can hang your hat on that one. All right, so 966. The Bible says there in 1 Kings 6, 1, that 480 years previous, that's 1446 B.C., that they came out of the land of Egypt. That's the Exodus. Now, Bible critics deny, they say that 1 Kings 6, 1 is wrong. Okay? They say 1 Kings 6.1 is wrong. 1 Kings 6.1, uh, the 480 years was not actually 480 years. Because they, they, there's a number of reasons why they like to say that. But uh, one is that they, that they use faulty evidence and they say that there was no city of Jericho that was inhabited in 1406 when they came into the land of, e of Canaan. They say that... Um, uh, uh, I had another thought in my mind. I lost it. Oh, they say that the, the conditions in Egypt in 1446 were not such as are described in the book of Exodus. Okay? As if they were there and saw it. You know, and, and they know that. Oh, yes. Um, I'm reading a book on, on evolution right now. And, and the, the whole issue is not the evidence we both, we all look at the same evidence. Okay? Creationists look at the evidence. Evolutionists look at the evidence. We see fossils. They see fossils. We see comets in the sky. They see comets. It's all in our worldview of how we interpret what we see. And it's the same thing with Egypt uh, and, and any of these archaeologists and so on. We see the same evidence. We pull the same pottery out of the ground. And then we interpret it one way, and they interpret it another way. Okay? So, when they say, no, 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 there wasn't, the conditions in Egypt were not such as are described in Exodus in 1446. That was in 1250. Well, then what they're saying is that 1 Kings 6.1, the date or the time of that, is wrong. 
So they're denying the scriptures. They're saying the Bible has errors. Okay? They're saying the numbers in the Bible are not reliable. Okay, so 966, hang your hat on it. 1446, 1 Kings 6 1 says it's, that's the way it was. 480 years previous to this. Now, so I choose to believe the Bible, and I'm sure you do as well, or you wouldn't be here. But somewhere in this 400, 480 years, we have a time of judges. Okay? We have a time actually before the judges. Sorry, I missed. I miss. We have a time of conquest. Here we go. And then a time of judges. And then we have a time of Saul. And that's 40 years. And we have a time of David. And that's 40 years. And then the four years of Solomon. Okay, so I can give you the outside dates. And then you, and you know these are solid dates because the Bible says they are. Now, the time of the judges is what's left. It's real simple. About 350 years. Any questions on that? So... All right, I know there was something else I was going to point out about that. Sure. Yes? Can they say something as well about the uh, Pharaoh at the time? Is there another sure. reason why? Yeah, there's, well, that's partly what I mean by the condition. The, the, the Pharaohs that were there don't seem to match the Pharaohs in the Bible and so on. And, and, then, you, and then you read someone else and they say it fits perfectly, you know, so. Okay. <clears throat> So that's the time period that we're looking at. Um, I keep getting this map out and getting ahead of myself here. But um, the, the time that we're going to deal with, with Saul, 1050 to 586, uh, the first 120 years of this time period, between 1050 to 930, are the United Kingdom. Um, when, the, when the United Kingdom splits into two or splinters into two, uh, you have the divided kingdom, 20 bad kings in the north, 20 bad kings in the south, or right thereabouts, depending on if you include a couple of them that reigned for seven days and things like that. So, Okay, let's look at the map. I will pull it out for good this time to show you a couple things. <clears throat> um, the land of Israel uh, was divided into tribes, of course. That took place in the book of Joshua. Uh, Joshua, with the, with the direction of the Lord, gave the tribes their areas. And, and those tribal areas almost always, generally always, stayed the same. Um, there's one major exception to that. The tribe of Dan was down here close to the Philistines, and they were too big a sissies. They said, we cannot drive out the, the inhabitants of the land. Uh, so they moved to the north. And in the process, they took a, took a bad prophet with them, a, a bad priest actually with them, and they started kind of their own worship system up in the north. Uh, they killed a whole bunch of people up there, which I guess was, you know, they were supposed to do that anyway, and killing the inhabitants of the land. They, they should have done that down here. So they go up here and they kill a bunch of women and kids, is really what they did. And they took over that city and established their own religious system. Anyway, so that's, that's during the time of the Judges. It's very loose. The Bible says in the book of Judges, chapter uh, 17, verse 6, that every man did that which was right in his own eyes. The last verse in the book of Judges says that in, their, in those days there was no king in Israel. And it doesn't finish the thought, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And so they come to the point where the children of Israel are fed up, not with their sin. They're not fed up with their own uh, inability to conquer. They blame everybody else. And they said, we want a king to reign over us. Okay, so <clears throat> Saul, they eventually, I'm just summarizing for now, but they eventually, they pick Saul from the smallest tribe of Israel. He's in this area right here, the tribe of Benjamin. Now, I don't know why, exactly why they, they thought they needed a guy from the tribe of Benjamin, but Benjamin 
was the youngest of all of the sons of Jacob. And a lot of scholars think that they wanted or they, they needed a king who would not think that he was above everybody else. You know, if they got somebody from Judah or from Reuben or some of the older ones or the more prominent uh, sons of Jacob. Instead, they got one from the youngest uh, of the sons of Jacob. Anyway, and Saul becomes the king and he doesn't establish much of an area. Um, he, he doesn't, it's real weird, and this is where, where we see his failed leadership, I think, is when, he, when he's chosen to be the king, the first thing he does when the party's over and the big feast is over, he goes back home. He goes back home. He didn't set up a kingdom. He didn't set up a capital. He didn't set up a government. He goes home and says, oh, life is going to hopefully go on like normal. And, and you can't do that. You're the king. So anyway, there's no leadership here still. And so he does very little conquering. He fights the Philistines, and most of the time he loses. And when he doesn't lose, it's because somebody else stepped in and saved his neck. David, Jonathan, okay? Uh, Saul was not uh, a military leader in a lot of ways. He was a, he was a bad uh, he was a failed leader, no question. David comes on the scene, and David spreads out the territory. We know that David, the Bible says, he had bloody hands. You know, he was a man of war. And, and evidently, I, I think sometimes we don't give him enough credit. We say, oh yeah, God killed Goliath. You know, he just guided that little stone. The right. Well, the Bible says that David was a, uh, was a man of war. Uh, we know several times uh, concerning David. My arm's getting tired. We know several times concerning David that uh, he, he killed hundreds of Philistines by himself. One time he was trying to win a wife and he killed a hundred Philistines by himself. Was it 200? I forget. 200. 200. Okay, I mean, 100 have been enough, you know. And he went and said, I'll get me an extra hundred here. Um... He's a man of war. They sang about him that he killed. Uh, he, he has slain his ten thousands. I mean, this guy was, a, was an animal out there on the battlefield. You know, we think of him as the shepherd holding a sheep. Well, remember, he also went after a bear and a lion and a giant. <laughs> uh, not saying that the giant's equivalent to the bear and the lion, but he might have been. So... Anyway, David spread out the land. He, he conquered huge sections of territory. And, and in the process, he set it up for Solomon then, who took over after him. And the Bible says that Solomon got tribute from all of these countries around. Solomon got tribute from the north. He got a lot of, you can barely see the tip of, uh, this is a piece of the, of the Red Sea and leads down to the Persian, not Persian Gulf, the, uh, the Indian Ocean. Anyway, uh, but it's part of the Red Sea. And uh, he had all kinds of trading going on by ships. And the Bible says, seems to indicate those ships, his ships probably sailed uh, around the, the bottom of India, out into Africa, all the way south into Ethiopia and many, many places around the world. Uh, he had huge relations with neighboring countries, and, of course, that fits in with what he then started to do was to marry uh, a woman of that country, uh, the king's, uh, part of the king's harem or whatever, so that, uh, so that he could establish the relations with, with these countries. So the kingdom grew greatly. Now, during the time of the kings of Israel and Judah, when the nation split, uh, a lot of that land was lost, a lot of the tribute was lost. And, and so on. There's a few that gained some of that back, but never to the extent that David and Solomon had it when they, when they controlled it. Okay. <clears throat> what time do I have here? A few, few more minutes here. <clears throat> oh, I'm in the wrong section. Here we go. All right. Let me give you some notes. Uh, tell you what, I'll let you out early. I'll let you out early. No point in starting this. I've got 10 minutes. <clears throat> um, just understand that this, this is a transition time period. Um, when we go into the kingdom of Saul, uh, um, 
we, we criticize Saul a lot, and I do, and I think he deserves it. He's a failed leader. But at the same time, imagine this. Uh, imagine that you have people who lived as uh, servants for hundreds of years in Egypt. They come out and they come into the promised land. They live as basically agriculturalists. They're farmers. They're shepherds. And all of a sudden you take out, uh, here's a guy, Saul, here's a guy who is out after the donkeys of his father who had gotten lost. Okay, now t some of you, you might say, well, that's weird as all get out. Well, I was a farmer. I understand that. I, I grew up on a farm, and I remember one time we had cows that got out of the fence, and we didn't realize it until three days after they were gone. And we tracked those cows for two days before we found them. Okay? All I'm saying is these guys were farmers, you know, and I, I'm calling myself a farmer and a hick here, but uh, they, they lived off the land. And all of a sudden, you take Saul from that and you, you make him the king. I mean, he's a novice. I mean, he's completely naive. He has no comprehension of how to run a kingdom. Okay? David, I'm sure, watched that. Growing up, he was, in, he was a shepherd at first, but then he went into the palace of Saul. And he saw what, I'm sure, some of the mistakes. And he said, man, okay, when I become the king, he knew he was going to be the king. When I become the king, I, the first thing I got to do is I got to be the leader. I got to set up a kingdom. I have to set up a government. And then Saul, Solomon, I'm sorry, Solomon takes that, David's ideas, and extends them, of course, to the nth degree and has this huge administration feeding all these people, over thousands of people a day and so on like that. So we criticize him, and, and rightly so, for lots of things. But at the same time, he's coming out off the farm and he's moving you know, into a position of a leader of probably a couple million people. And uh, he had no idea, <laughs> no idea what he was doing. All right, we'll stop there and uh, pick up with our criticism of Saul in the next class period. Next class period. Next class period. Next class period. Next class period.